Today is August 16th, 2018. And in Australia, just a few months ago, there was the wrap-up of a Royal Commission report which had 4,000 Catholic children. Those are the ones who stepped forward, and another 4,000 children who are now in, in their 60s. Or and you can be sure that if 4,000 came forward, many others didn't because they don't want to upset their spouse or their children. And it's, it's a huge number. I'm not here to talk about pedophilia. I'm here to talk about the MK Ultra program. And many of those children were sexually abused even as a, an intentional part of the, their MK Ultra training, their mind control, torture, actually. And many years have gone by now. I found out about MK Ultra in 2005 and have been, you might say, concentrating on the case, but not much has happened. And I now would say we can't wait for the situation to correct itself. It, that will never happen. In fact, it's getting worse. And in the year 1975, almost a half century ago, Senator Frank Church brought forward some information about this and other CIA misbehavior, such as secret assassinations. And that didn't turn into anything either, other than you know, a little bit of talk about it. So my purpose today is to say what is available legally for you, if you are a victim or a friend of a victim, to how can you go to court and do something about this? I imagine that in that diocese they mentioned today, there is some kind of payout to those children. In the Melbourne Diocese in Australia, there, there has been a very formal program whereby the person comes forward, tells his story, and he gets some kind of money. That's not what I'm here to talk about, nor am I to talk about Congress passing a law to give compensation, as they sometimes do. For instance, the soldiers who suffered from Agent Orange, they got out a handout, although they got that because they started as a court case, and then it turned into a payout instead. You may, of course, wish that you get the best deal, and maybe the best deal for you would come through such a thing. but. Well, I'm going to pretend that it wouldn't, because uh, I just want to talk about the other options. And that is, instead of getting a payout, even when you go to court and sue someone, and finally he says, he, he may be the government, he says, sure, thank you, we apologize, here's some big amount of money for you, and you sign a gag order, what you call non-disclosure, and you, know, you go away a little bit compensated or vindicated by the whole thing, but that doesn't help anyone else as it doesn't set any precedent in the court, so that the next person coming forward cannot point to you as the sample of, well, they paid the money to her. No, it doesn't really become a court ruling. I'll name three precedents to you, and they're quite paltry, but it's better than nothing. I've been aware of these for many years. Perhaps you have, too. I think it was 1990, maybe? Paul Bonacci, B-O-N-A-C-C-I. He was one of the Nebraska children who were trafficked. A lot of this has to do with the trafficking of children. I'll get to that later. And that, of course, is a crime. But at this time, I'm not talking about prosecuting the criminals. I'm very interested in that. I could say a word later about it. But I'm only talking about you taking a civil action to court. And you may think that's impossible because of the price of lawyer, although you could get legal aid in many states. You may think it's impossible because of statute of limitations, but again, several states, in Australia, three of the states out of six, have already passed legislation that pretty much says no more statute of limitations on this type of case. And one other thing that might put you off, or two things, you may feel you can't sue the government. That's not quite true. I'll, I'll explain in a moment. There are several ways to do it, actually. And you might also think, you don't have the proofs. You want, do I have an eyewitness to what they did to me? Well, my grandmother, but she died, or she won't talk, or something. You don't need your proofs, and you don't need your case watertight when you put it forward. You file a case, and that means you make your pleadings. And in the pleadings, you tell your story. And you do not at that moment have to bring in any evidence. In fact, you can't bring in evidence. 
you just tell it, and the judge looking at it has to accept it um, tentatively. He can't say, well, that didn't happen, so I'm throwing the case out. No. And you summon the other person, the defendant. The, you have the court clerk sign this little thing. You send a summons to the other side, and then they write in and tell their side of the story. And they may say, she's a complete nutter. None of this ever happened. And you're probably afraid that will end it, because it has ended it in the past. I'm sorry to say, many such cases were seen as unbelievable. But don't worry about that anymore. They are no longer unbelievable. There are huge amounts of evidence and cases out there, including those ones which I said are just pedophilia regarding the priests. But, well, who would ever have dreamed that priests are doing that? So <laughs> some of those children I heard when they were speaking in the Royal Commission hearings in Australia, they even said that they told the truth and their parents wouldn't believe them. See, I mean, it was unbelievable, right? Because your parent would want to protect you. Now, the other thing that you might be concerned about that, well, if the others haven't, you know, who am I to be able to be the successful one? Go on, do it. You may be the successful one. Right now, I'm in court myself. I am a plaintiff. It has nothing to do with MK Ultra or sexual abuse. And I have put my case. I did it as a pro se. That means for herself cost me $400 to walk into the court, and I lost the case, and now I'm appealing it, and that cost $500. So I'm out of pocket, only a total of $900 so far. There's no lawyer involved because pro se means for himself. And if you decide to go that method, it has to be you alone. So if I had had a sister or someone to join me in my case, then I couldn't have gone pro se and got the cheap method of the 400, because it has to be just one individual. That may put to your mind the idea of class actions. I know of persons who have signed up, say, because of faulty products or food that was poisonous or, or something, and they know a hundred other people in the area that had the same experience. They go for a class action. All I can say about that is I don't know. So. I'm no, no use to you on describing that, other than I have heard it's not a very good method, but maybe it is. Now, for you to go to court, here's what you could do. You have to choose whom, whom are you going to sue. And here I'm talking about MK Ultra, not pedophilia, okay? And I repeat, many of the people involved in MK Ultra were sexually abused as children, even as almost newborns, if you want to look at pedophilesdownunder.com belongs to the Australian lady. She's 38 years old now, I think, uh, around that age. And she um, has uncovered huge amounts of information about MK Ultra in Australia. And though I've lived in Australia for many years, I did not know it was there until another person told me it's been there since the 1944 or so. Anyway, the point is you go for the baddies. The person to sue, you can't start low on the food chain. You could start with a clerk who maybe brought false information about you. You can sue that person. Allow me to explain that we have two kinds of law, public law and private law. Public law usually means you violated a law or you're a criminal, and that is handled as a criminal case. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the other thing, civil case. And that really is any two individuals, all private organizations, who can sue each other. So imagine that you lived in a little village, and you, you and the person whom you're in dispute with, maybe he's done something bad, maybe you think he stole something, you go to the village chief, and probably the whole society will sit around on the grass and make noises and decide who they, <laughs> who's going to win the case. And in that instance, it's just any two persons. But today we tend to think of ourselves as all these little individuals like me, all these little ones, against this big thing called government. There is no big thing called government. There's only us. And though you have to walk into a courthouse, which may look a bit intimidating or even quite impressive, and think that you're asking for the help from this judge. No, you're disputing with this other citizen, who, let's say, was the clerk, who did you wrong in relation to MK Ultra? And it's the judge's duty, just like the village chief. He sits there and listens to both sides. 
So you put your side in first. And as I said, at that moment, you don't have to have anything prepared, uh, you know, proofed, all cleaned up and ready to present. You just have what you remember. And when you don't remember someone's name or never knew it in the first place, you can use temporarily the name John Doe. And the beauty of going to court is that you then get the authority and the muscle of the court to work for you in finding the evidence. So let's say that this clerk says, I never sent a letter like that. Then you're entitled to discovery. And all her records can be subpoenaed. You've seen this, like Hillary's emails are, are all suddenly on, available publicly. That person cannot hide their stuff. If they do, the judge can say, you don't give us what we ask you. You are in contempt of court. I send you to jail. And they have to sit in jail until they decide they will cough up the material. Or they may voluntarily lose the case. I mentioned Paul Bonacci a minute ago. And he had a case against, gee, I, I don't remember. It was someone in government. I think it, it involved that Larry King person <laughs> who we know is a singer because he sang the national anthem at the Republican National Convention. And he and some others, said Larry, were trafficking children around, including trafficking them, trafficking them to the White House in 1989. That was recorded in a story by the Washington Times. And then it was quickly dropped. But once he filed, the other side didn't want to go through discovery, right? So they didn't show up. I mentioned that you send a summons to the other side. Most of persons being summoned are pretty eager to get in there in the like 30-day deadline or whatever it is, so that you don't win without them. If they don't show up at all, you win by default. So let's say you had demanded that they give you $50,000. They don't show up. The judge would make that award in your favor. But having been given an award by a judge on paper is not the same as putting your mitts on the money. That takes a little bit more work. But the point I want to make is those who don't want to be discovered can sort of quit the case. And they do. Then there was the case of Valma Arlico, I think her name is Orlico, O-R-L-I-K-O-W. Unfortunately, <laughs> when she was mistreated as she was in the Allen Memorial Hospital at Montreal. Her husband was an MP, I guess. <laughs> they must not have known that, or they wouldn't have dared to do to her what they did. And that was the famous Deep Sleep Program. Also was, was done cruelly in Australia. They would take a person in hopes of wiping their mind out, really. They really wanted to make you into somebody else later, so that you know, take away Mary Smith and make her into Mary Jones, or even maybe make her into John Jones, by putting new things in her brain. It wasn't all that successful. They really didn't, um, they couldn't put new thoughts in through that program, maybe through other programs. But when they tried to wipe the person's brain out, they wiped out all learning, even the learning to walk. I think walking is natural. You don't have to learn it or going to the toilet or anything else. So those persons were completely disabled when they got out. And Velma won her case. She won about, I think, a million dollars many years ago. And then Canada, see, it wasn't, it was CIA, but they were behaving badly over the border. So the Canadian government invited Canadians who had suffered like Velma to also file a claim. But they put a cap of money. It was a, one of these things I mentioned earlier, like Congress says, we're going to pay everybody now a certain amount. That's not really the court paying it out. So Velma won in court. And I suppose they didn't want any more Velmas coming up. So they offered that people could come forward administratively, make a claim, and be paid. The one other case I know, there aren't many. Now, see, there may have been hundreds that were settled out of court, and we just don't know about them. But those that make it made it in court, one, was, I actually can't think of her name, but I can think of the, her, her successor. And that was a girl named Alison Steele. 
she's alive today, her mother, Jean Steele, was subjected to this sleep treatment thing. They actually, you know, put you into like an induced coma and then they played tapes in your brain 24 hours a day, along with LSD, electric shock, a few other things just to make sure you were no longer yourself. Can you imagine? Anyway, not many years ago, somebody won a case and then, again, I think it might have been the provincial government of Quebec or something said, other people who are similar with the sleep treatment, come to us and we'll see if you're worthy of a payout. And one girl, Jean Steele, put her name in and they deemed her not worthy. Then another, the one whose name I can't think of, won a case in court. The word of that reached Allison, the daughter of Jean, who was now deceased, Jean. Allison says, you shouldn't have turned my mother down. She, when we were children, she couldn't even care for us. She was you know, like bedridden from this treatment she got at Allen Memorial Hospital, Montreal. So, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> that's nice for Allison, but she got money out of court. So they paid her an, an undisclosed amount, because that's part of her promise to keep the secret, perhaps, of how much money she got. So I don't begrudge to her that she took the money and ran, but it, it doesn't stand as a precedent for others, but you can be the precedent. And there should be some precedents now in the way I will now describe. Let's say you have been, I'm gonna, I know of a girl who's been through a particular thing. She's very secretive about it, so she's not any one of the famous names that you've heard of. And I think I will call her Daisy, okay? So Daisy was given the usual, taken to military bases at various parts of the United States, sold out for child prostitution, if you could call it that, made to perform in not just child porn movies. And have you heard lately, by the way, President Trump ordered a certain huge uh, sweep of a law that's been on the books for a while, but it wasn't enforced. Men who look at kitty porn on the internet, you may say that's not a crime. After all, a person is free in their own life to do what they want. But it has been made a crime by legislation, probably on the basis that if th someone is going to be producing those shows to sell them for money, that creates a market. And that market is what ends up with these kids having to do it. So I know some other kids who were made to do it, and they are very happy with that law. They think even if it's a little bit out of the ordinary for American freedom, for someone not to be able to watch a show, and, and I mean men who then didn't proceed to do something else, they just watched the show. They were recently swept up, thousands of them. You can look it up on the internet. By the way, those things are not secret. You may have heard that there's some privacy involved when there are court cases of pedophilia or even in a divorce case, a custody battle between mom and dad, things that are said about the kid, uh, the judge can put a seal on to protect the privacy of a child, and he should. But the fact of being arrested either for molesting a child or this watching this porn stuff is public knowledge, of course. After all, just as I said with the village chief, Who's, who's the judge? <laughs> well, the village chief was sort of like the symbolic leader, but it's really the society that decides what's right and what's wrong and who should get punished or not. And it's our fault because we're too, um, I guess you'd say, worshipful of those above us. And we are. That's a human trait. Because of that business of worshiping the, those in authority or those of just prestige, or just famous people, or people who can intimidate you by their wealth or whatever. Because we don't go after them, we end up all looking around and saying to each other, hey, well, that's how it is. When you, I want to tell you a side story in a minute. I'll tell you now. I was a student in Adelaide Law School and many years after graduating, I went back to a seminar and one of the faculty members said, just in passing, she just said it as if it was like saying dogs bark. She said, of course, 
government people won't be prosecuted. <laughs> in other words, they're, they're buddies, the judges are DPP in Australia, Director of Public Prosecution. They won't do it. And I actually lost control of myself, which I've only done a few times in my life. I went berserk to hear a faculty member of a law school say, you know, don't worry, if you're in government, don't worry about getting prosecuted. You won't get prosecuted. Okay, so the point is, are they prosecutable? Of course they are. Of course they are. In America, there's no one who's above the law. In Australia, there is technically one person, the monarch, that's the queen. Doesn't, doesn't affect other members of her family, and it affects her. And that's a good thing. You say, oh, nobody should be. No, that's not the point. She's supposed to be like our mother. You don't want someone hurting your mother, and you don't. That's life. So it's all right if you have to let her do something that you don't want her to do, because there are others that can take the rap for her. Indeed, if she is seen to do something wrong, the minister on her panel that is most related to, the, like she did something wrong in education, or whatever, the minister of education will be seen to step down and apologize for his bad behavior. Never mind that. I'm not trying to say someone should be let off just in that one instance, but no one else should ever be let off because they have the money to intimidate you or because they're in the mafia and they will break your legs or blah, blah, blah. That is what we do. But as I was starting to say about this other thing, like even where those doctors were performing horrible things on the people who innocently went into the hospital with depression or whatever, and they're having their brain, you know, gutted out. And how can they be get away with it? It's our problem. Just like happened in that seminar in the law school one day, people say that they don't even have to say it. We just sort of are vaguely aware of it. The strong won't get prosecuted. So they should, and I'm really big into that. Check out two of my books, Prosecution for Treason and Fraud Upon the Court. Uh, I can show you many ways to get them, but that's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to bring a civil lawsuit. Now, who to bring it against? As I just said, there is one instance only in Australia, the monarchy can't do it. But what about America? Can you sue the president? Well, I'm suing the president right now in my case. It's considered a very respectable case. It's Maxwell v. Trump. And you can do it because if you're accusing someone of doing what's really not in their job description, let me take the case of a policeman. And there have been a few lawsuits like this. This is written into a particular part of the law called 42 USC 1983. I will repeat, 42 USC 1983. And it, it was part of the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And it's against police brutality. And what it says is, OK, a cop can manhandle you a little bit when he's arresting you if you're trying to run away. I mean, there has to be some permission for him to do things, right? But it certainly doesn't mean he can do what he likes. He can't, you know, urinate on your feet to make you feel embarrassed. If he does those things, he's doing what is not in his job. Therefore, he's not acting as a policeman. I mean that to be used against various people, not police, because that little section of the law virtually says, please come forward, sue. We'll help you. The government will help you sue brutal cops. But never mind cops, they have been brutal doctors. I just mentioned the ones in Canada, but all the MK Ultra children, and how many are there? I mean, I think I've met about 12, and why would I meet many? I just met a tiny bit. It must have been a lot of children. Rather typically, they were on army bases as the son and daughter of a soldier, and either their parents, or sometimes grandparents, were criminals, and were offered freedom, lifetime freedom from prosecution if they hand their kid over for patriotic experiments. They always throw that in just to make people forget their guilt. They say, we need to study this stuff because we have to learn how to deal with the enemy. You know, something. And another way they got the parents, sad to say, was just by money. Many of these 
kids now realize that their mom or dad got a big handout of money for letting them be experimented on. But it's the doctors I'm talking about right now. And again, you don't have to know the name of the doctor. You would have to know something about where it was, what hospital or something. And then, thanks to the power of subpoena, well, for one thing, those doctors can be called in as witnesses and similarly must talk. You think you, think you can say in court, I refuse to speak on the grounds that it may incriminate me? You can say that. You're in, encouraged to say it, thanks to the, I think, Fifth Amendment, if it's you being accused of a crime. In fact, if I were accused right now of stealing your car, I can choose not to go to the court when I'm being tried for that crime, so then even get to see whether, what tone of voice I would use defending myself. No one in America has to defend themselves. Okay. But if you're called in as a witness on someone else's case, and the judge says, or the, the, the opposite attorney says, well, where were you that day? Let me see your passport. It shows that you were in France, and you're saying you were in New York. And they can beat you down as a witness. So a nurse who may have simply viewed what was happening to you, even if she never touched you, she can be brought in as a witness. And by the way, she can be brought in as an accessory or accomplice. For every one of these bad deals that was happening, crimes, there are related crimes. If a murder was involved, there's never a statute of limitations. Get to that one in a minute. But if it's murder or treason, it goes forever. And so does the um, related thing. So a murderer might have had a getaway car, right? Well, the driver of the getaway car was his accessory in the crime. And the newspaper, who gave a false story deliberately the next day, the journalist who wrote it, is an accessory after the fact. In fact, the whole practice of cover-up of a crime is a crime. And that's, you can find, I don't have the number of it, but it's a crime. I think I do have it. I think it might, might be 4 U.S.C. 1801. Uh, just look it up. If you cover up a crime, you are criminal. So these lower echelon people who may have been terribly afraid and may have had a gun held to their head, as it were, saying, <laughs> you're, you're not going to tell. This doctor's doing something bad, but you know it's none of your business, and it's a national security issue. And if you tell you're committing a crime, oh, by the way, in Australia, the attorney general, whose name was George Brandis, he's quit since, but he passed, or got, got parliament to pass. Very easy to do in Australia. If you're in the party with the most votes, you can just make it happen. And he made it happen that we, journalists in Australia, cannot tell secrets about crimes of government. I assure you, he committed a crime in doing that. The law is sacred, and there are many, many provisions within the law to guard the law. I'll give you a silly example. The other day I saw on a bulletin board in the library, somebody's dog was stolen. Oh no, it was actually, I, don't, I won't say what it was, because I might trace the person, but say it was a dog. And she says, my dog was stolen at 5 o'clock last week. Please come back with it. No questions asked, right? <laughs> That's actually criminal. <laughs> Nobody's ever, ever going to hurt her for it. But she is, she's kicking the law in the teeth. She's saying, yeah, it says you can't steal a dog, but I'm going to let you get away with it. <laughs> See? So there are many just amazing protections of law, protections of justice. If you want to look up the main person who wrote about this, his name is Sir William Blackstone. Now, what was my point? I forget. That when you wish to bring your case forward and you haven't got a whole lot to go on, you can go on small parties. And by the way, you could even ask that a witness be arrested. They won't get a criminal record for it. And I mean really an innocent witness, all right? Not the ones I just said, which are accessories or whatever. Someone who knows about something, and you want them in there, you might even want to get them under the Witness Protection Act, because they may be thoroughly scared to talk in your favor. And they can actually be arrested. Since 1793 in the US, 
Congress allowed or Congress passed the Witness Protection Act, sorry, the Material Witness Act. Someone who has material knowledge of you, and that doesn't mean physical material, it means knowledge that is material to your winning or losing the case, you can actually be arrested and brought in. That might be right or wrong or good or bad, I don't know, but in some cases it would be good. I'm just saying that's another protection for law. You see how important law is? And law is sacred, and law is up there, and the structure is so perfect, except for a few idiots like George Brandis who goes around changing one malevolently. The law is there and you should honor it, and my encouraging you to sue as regards MK Ultra, has something to do with my wanting us to stop acting like the law has been sh shredded and is all over the floor and nobody cares anymore. Make it work. Might you run into a corrupt judge? Yes. If you do, see me. My job is to get judges. Anyway, back to the case. You bring in your case, and I would recommend that anyone who was mistreated by a hospital or a university go straight for the jugular. We have known for a long time, it's admitted by various CIA directors over the years, that the MKUltra program had at least 80 sub-projects. I'm sorry, I don't know the exact number, but I said at least 80. And they were farmed out or contracted out to MIT or Notre Dame University or anything for persons there, typically in a psychology department, but not always to perform, and they too were performing cruel things on children with no consent, nothing like consent. They are definitely crimes, even if they put their hands on the child in such a way as to hold the child down or inject something. They are assaulting that child. That child hasn't come to them as a patient wanting medical service. So go for them and go for their university, or go, you know, go for the doctor and the hospital, or the professor and the university. One man whom we know, I believe it has been admitted by the school, Ted Kaczynski. He turned out to be the Unabomber, probably fake, probably a patsy or Manchurian candidate, I don't know. He was only 17 at Harvard University, that's pretty young to be there, and he was MK Altred at Harvard. And Martin Orne, O-R-N-E, was one of the professors in psychology who did terrible things. He's now deceased, unfortunately. He did that boy and other people. So why not go for Harvard University? Indeed, isn't it disgusting that after all these years of the word being put out publicly that they were involved in those things, no president of that university, and to my knowledge, no professor, even low-grade professor, has ever said, this is shocking and terrible, and I'm sorry that it happened through our school. So you go and tell them, okay? Call them into court. It's easy. You may lose the case. You know, some lawyers will take a case on contingency. Most lawyers won't take these cases at all. So show them this little video of me telling them it's okay. I know they think it's not okay. That's because of the tradition I was just mentioning. You feel, I can't do that. Oh, no, they don't do that. Well, do it. <laughs> then you can't say they don't do it. There's criminal court, there's civil court, and there's another thing called the Court of Equity. And this was around until, oh, I think about 30 years ago, and it, it kind of disappeared, but it hasn't actually disappeared because it's never been repealed as a form of law. And in that kind of court, the judge can make uh, what they call constructive remedies. It, it's interesting. He can sort of make justice happen in his own way. And there's also a rule within the Court of Equity that a person can be, has to disgorge any ill-gotten gains. So there's some money for if you're looking for the ways to get paid out for this business. And if you're too shy to go to court, get together with some people and fill out affidavits, which I think you have to have either be doing it in front of a justice of the peace or a lawyer or someone. And you must only say in the affidavit things that you really know. You can't just give opinions. And you sign it under penalty of perjury. And if there are enough of those affidavits, in my opinion, I, haven't, I don't know of a reference that I can use for this ever having happened, but 
you would think that a number of affidavits, there's no court case happening. Nobody's paying lawyers anything. But you've assembled affidavits, or a lesser thing is called a statutory declaration, I think which has also in it some penalty, maybe not the same as perjury. And another way you can do it is create a deposition. Okay, now we, we, I've left the realm of proper law, and I'm just doing make-believe stuff here. You can make your own little thingy whereby an actor, being a prosecutor, will cross-examine you. Like, he'll try to beat you down. I mean, you want him to do that. And this is all recorded, and it's called a deposition. So sometimes, within a real court case, maybe the person can't be reached. She lives in Ohio or something, and they, they send someone out to talk to her, and her little scene on video uh, be can be put into the case. And I'm not saying that you can do that on a specific case. I really don't know, and I'm not aware of it happening outside of an actual case. But call it a deposition, or we even call it a pretend deposition. Nothing wrong with saying that. And show how your case would look if someone was actually having your case. So I say again, in order to wrap it up, due to 48 minutes having passed. Yes, sir, are we out of time? Um, what can you do? Well, I'll name two other things just to cover the field here. I, sh I should have said this before, although I don't want to get into the criminal spot. But now, uh, um, here I'm changing character here, and I'm going to talk about the criminal aspect. You can at any moment go into a police office and file a complaint and it may be 10 years old or way past the statute, you can still file it. You can say, I want to report a crime. They can't refuse you. I mean, they might refuse you, but be insistent. I want to report a crime. Now, recently, this girl, Fiona Barnett in Australia, she, she has reported crimes many times. And boy, are they going to be sorry when they find out that she really has won now. She's won public opinion. She put out so much on her website, pedophilesdownunder.com, and she is a person of authority. She knows what she's doing. And because of that, it may now be that instead of a similar person walking into a police office and being sent home with no record of it having happened, that person will feel more entitled to insist on reporting. So which of us ever bothers to go report a crime? You know, there's a whole peace movement that talks about war crimes, but have any of those persons ever walked into a police station near where one of the persons they can name who has done these war crimes and reported it? You may think, oh, that's international. No, it isn't. In 1996, the U.S. passed the War Crimes Act, and it has to do specifically with prosecuting a man or a girl right here in the U.S. who committed a war crime somewhere else. There's a whole setup of law to make them answer. Why don't they answer? Nobody prosecutes. Now, you remember my little experience in the law school seminar when I lost control, because they said, those people are protected or something. I don't think that's the case in this instance. I don't think Americans realize that war crimes are domestic crimes. They're in the domestic criminal law. OK. Now, if you fail at that, and by the way, I went into my lawyer's office recently, and because I don't like going into police stations, as I've tried it twice, and there's a glass, like a big, you'd have in a bank, total separation of me and the person behind it. And I'm short, and I have to <laughs> get on tiptoe and talk through this little, you know, sort of metal grate in between. It's not something you want to do. So I asked the lawyer to hand me some complaint forms and he handed me one. I brought it home. When I opened it, I saw that it was police complaint. It was complaint about the police. I guess he missed my point. I meant something that you would go to the police with as a complaint of any crime, like that happened to you. So the point is you have to do it. I guess you could mail it in. I mean, of course, you'd make a big record. You'd even take a photo of yourself, a selfie of yourself, putting it in the post box, or send it, of course. Re return receipt requested. And then you have proof that you have made that complaint. 
this is very important. Isn't it ridiculous that, you know, if your car was stolen or even something less, you'd be down there in a minute reporting it and not feeling intimidated at all to report it. So why feel intimidated when it's something more horrible than that? Now, if you cannot get that kind of satisfaction, then there's another group that's open to you to listen, and it's called the Grand Jury. For this, please go to the website of Bill Windsor, who has a whole series on YouTube called Lawless America. He drove all over the country finding examples which are disgusting, and they are rife. And he, he didn't solve it, but he did a lot by talking it up as to the, you know, the wrong way in which court cases are handled, sometimes deliberately cruelly, I would say. But this, his point was, there is another source to go to, and that is the grand jury in your state. You know that your state has an attorney general, but that your district has a DA district attorney. And those persons may think that they are in charge of grand juries, but they're not. And Justice Scalia came out with a case. Oh, darn, I can't think of the name of the case. It was 1992. And he said, and his words are considered very usable for any other such case, he said, according to our Constitution, there are various players, like the legislature, the judiciary, the states, who have certain rights in the Constitution, and we think the people through the Bill of Rights, but the people also through the grand jury system, he said. And to take away the behavior that was given to them, really in the Fifth and Sixth Amendments, which is that every criminal case brought forward has to be done by indictment of a grand jury, you mustn't take away the role of the citizen. Just by sort of habit, or maybe deliberate slate of hand, probably the latter, the states have said, oh, well, our Department of Justice, or whatever they have, is, is the supervisor of the grand jury. And it's not for you the member of the grand jury, to go out to the public and collect information that somebody has done something cruel or bad or whatever. Yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. It is a grand juror's job to do that. In fact, in early Massachusetts, I'll just the only state I've bothered to study, but I imagine they're all the same. It was not, you'd get impaneled, they'd make up a grand, it's only grand in that there's 23 men instead of 12, right? And they don't try a case, they're not going to decide whether somebody did wrong. They are going to look for crime, and then if they find it, they put it through the paces, which means then somebody gets prosecuted, and then they no longer see it again. A, a real jury, a petite jury, gets to see it. So while they're doing their job, in Massachusetts, they were also to look around for broken bridges or potholes or anything in the community that, that needs attention. That's what the grand jury was for, and there's no reason for that role to have ended. Just because our lives have become a bit more complicated, a bit more bureaucratized, it doesn't mean that the sensibleness of that sort of thing has ended. As I said, through a little slate of hand, it has ended because we have a book called Rule, F, Fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, that's how I remember it, FRCP, but it means Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. In that book, which is easily the most boring book in the universe, they tell you how to do all these things, and the page that is dedicated to the handling of cases by the grand jury, it mentions on it, I think it's section eight, and it says note four. Well, the notes are not part of the law, the notes were written by an advisory committee or something, and it implies that the decision to prosecute such and such a criminal by the grand jury has to be co-signed by the state prosecutor. Well, forget it, okay? Forget it. We, we don't obey laws that are just notes. So there you have to be insistent, because you will be told you're wrong. You tell them you're right, okay? Just stuff the Constitution down their throat, because that's where this is. There's also something else called mandamus. Yours truly is, has no experience with that. But I noticed recently that um, a group in New York, I think, New York, 
went to their grand jury with some sort of a petition about opening the 9-11 case. And they said, here, Mr. Grand Juror, this is what we want you to do. And they have now told the rest of us, and if he won't do it, our next step is to go to court and ask for a writ of mandamus, which is to ask someone to do their job. <laughs> so if the grand jury is not doing their job, you may get a court order telling them to do their job. So mandamus means tell them to do their job, but I'm, I'm not up on that. At least it has not entered into any of the things that I'm familiar with. And um, I also want to say that if, you, if you're just really looking for something else to do, low, okay, there's criminal prosecution, telling your grand jury about it, and something that's a little bit more open to the community is called truth commission. And the word commission usually means someone has been commissioned, but that's not true. You can make up a blue ribbon commission to judge the beauty of the telephone poles in your neighborhood or something. Commission just means, still though, I would advise that you call it committee because if you call it commission, some oh, you're appropriating authority that has never been given to you, blah, blah. But a committee, anybody can be a committee, right? So if you have a committee, a truth committee, or whatever you want to call it, and there again, instead of it being just a group of victims, now they are seen to be self-serving, and that's true, they are. But if you have just neighbors, friends, anybody, who will take information from the public. The other day, I put a sign on the internet saying I would sit at the swan boats on a certain afternoon at 2 o'clock. That's a thing in Boston. And anybody wanted to tell me something, <laughs> it was about it, I think it was about a particular case, I'll be there. Okay, nobody showed up. Well, for one thing, the ad was small and it was in the middle of a hot day, you know. But the point is, say they had come to me. And, and I have done it on other occasions and a few people have showed up. If you say that you just want to receive information, okay, there may be many people out there with hot stuff that want to tell, and they, they have no idea who to tell, and they certainly are not going to walk into a police office and get clobbered. But a truth commission, I mean, just have a meeting, you know, once a month at your house, or not even your house. You can do it at a McDonald's. You can do it on the steps of the State House, wherever you want. And it gets something going, and it's completely legitimate, legal. I mean, nobody can say, you are doing the wrong thing, you must not do that. Come on, anybody can do that. And during my little, I don't know if you could call it an investigation or what, of the Boston Marathon bombing, I was given the chance to speak at a library in a lecture, and I decided that after we finished one hour of me talking and showing videos, let the people talk and call it open mic. And by gosh, people did talk, and some things came out, and even after the camera was turned off that night, people had things they'd been wanting to say ever since the night of the, the capture of the boy at the boat in the water town in the marathon bar. And I, I can assure you, new material came forward. And that's just because we had open mic. And so there's nothing wrong with you having open mic. If you want to call it a poetry slam, and first you read five poems, and then you say, okay, any other poet want to get up? And maybe somebody gets up, and they, they're not speaking <laughs> in rhyme, but they're telling you things they want to tell you. So my message is never be put off by the fact that this hasn't already been done. I mean, think how many things in history had never been done until someone did them. It is high time we took, uh, took control of the MK Ultra situation. What was done to children, it, it's totally amazing. And many deaths were involved, including one child being told to kill another child. Several of the MK Ultra people have told me that they were taught that they were killing another child, but they now think maybe that death didn't occur, and they, they were fooled into thinking they had poisoned the kid or whatever. But in some cases, it did occur. We're teaching children to kill? This is just beyond words. And Probably because it's beyond words, we, it just push it away. You know, it's too much. But there's the problem. If you push it away because it's too much, then we don't get um, resolution of it, right? So, be take yourself to court. I mentioned that I'm in a court case that only costs 400. That's federal. I really don't know what each state charges, nor do I know if each state allows 
They have no right not to allow you realize a person to come forward without a lawyer. So you go look it up on the internet how to do it. Indeed, if you imitate the instructions that are on the internet for a federal case pro se, and you just sort of transmit it into language of your state instead, you could start somewhere. You start and fail. You start and fail five times. You, you feel good. You feel you've been in there. You're part of the game now. That's how I feel. Put my little foot into court and, hey, I think I'm somebody. So I'm saying, go sue these bastards. Go sue the universities and hospitals and doctors and nurses who did these things. And they may even be doing them as we speak. That I don't know. I'd like to say something else about FBI. They tend to set up rewards. You know, you can get a half a million or something for providing information that leads to arrest. Well, if the FBI is in on the game, they're not going to take your information. But again, there's good old trip to the post office and use return receipt requested. If you have something that you think could work, claim the reward. I'm not saying you'll get it. But by claiming it, here is the information I gave, and it should lead right to John Doe, because I know he did it. If they've put up a reward, and Congress also puts up some rewards. In the days that Condoleezza Rice was Secretary of State, they were like, you could get five million for something or other. So look federally and state-wise, and even maybe locally, for rewards. And as I said, apply for them. Say, I, I'm a winner. And even if you don't win, you'll be doing everyone a favor by claiming that you know who did it. And they should then have to investigate that person. It will be harder for them to throw it out the window. The group I would like most to see a lawsuit against as soon as possible is a group called False Memory Syndrome Foundation or whatever. These are persons, including the man Martin Orn, whom I mentioned whom you can actually see on YouTube video performing a terrible thing on a person putting her hand in a, a bunch of acid. It wasn't really acid, but she was told that it was. And uh, he and many others formed a group to stave off the reports by the MK Ultra victims by saying they have false memories. Sure, they say my grandfather and blah, blah, blah happened. And, but you know how it is, people. Maybe they thought it up, or maybe their psychotherapist who had read about it sort of planted it in their head. And in the early 1990s, a few people were starting to come forward with true stories. And wow, did that FMS group spring up quickly. And they were so successful. My darling late husband was a pediatrician, and I remember him saying, I'm going to guess this was around 1996, that he had heard those cases, and maybe he was interested, but at that time I knew nothing about it, so I wasn't paying attention, but he said, oh, I think this might have been the McMartin preschool case, where it looked like those kids were really reporting true abuse. And then the court threw it out because false memory that certain psychotherapists had planted those memories. And I'm telling you, my husband was a smart man, and he wasn't one to be fooled easily. He was fooled by it. He thought, oh, he probably saw it written up in the Lancet. To my husband, if it was in the Lancet, that was God speaking, you know? So many of the FMS board members were, doc probably all were doctors, and they did a tremendously bad thing. They can be sued right now, no problem. Sue every one of them. I repeat, take them to, I mean, if you're a victim, I can't do it. They didn't hurt me. If they have hurt you, you have grounds against them. And by the way, I know that MK Ultra persons all suffered true physical assault, but in court or in law, it's enough to say you're assaulted if someone has raised fear in you. Someone has scared you. They made it make a phone call. I'm going to get you tonight. That is like a physical assault. Trust me. 
assault in, in law isn't just when the hands hit your skin. It, it can be something coming in through your senses to your brain. All right. Now, the other thing that you might consider doing, and I guess you could be accused of abusive process, and I say, go ahead and do it. You could, you could get yourself sued for libel. By the way, libel is not a crime. You don't get into criminal law when you have libeled someone or slandered them or you know spoiled their reputation. But it is actionable by them against you. They can sue you for money if you've done it. Say it's me. I'm not a victim, so I can't do it. All right. But I tell about the baddie. I name him, and I said he did it, and he sues me. I'm taking a chance. They, the judge might go in his favor, and the next thing you know, my bank account gets gouged out. But it's unlikely. And also, if I have no money, they can't very well get my money, though it's bad business because they can make you declare bankruptcy, which harms your life. But if you're willing to do it, if you see that it might work in your case, get yourself sued for libel. Don't be afraid of doing the libel on the fear that you'll be sued. Go ahead with it, knowing you might be sued. And then once the case happens, there's your uh, ground that you can stand on to talk and, and get the case opened. One more thing, I'll probably get murderized for saying it, but you could turn yourself in. If you're an MK Ultra person who has killed people, and let's face it, many MK Ultra victims were forced to commit murders or less, you could go and confess it, as it were, just show up at the police station and have your little tote bag with you ready to stay overnight with a toothbrush and say, I did it. I want to be charged with that crime. There again, it's just interesting because you'd hardly think they would do it. And if they did it, boy, would your trial be interesting. Whew. To call the ombudsman method, in my opinion, is it's meant to not shut you up, but make you feel you've done something, and maybe they'll say something to somebody. But why do we have ombudsmen? We don't have them because they're fighters. As far as I know, they don't really fight for you. So think twice before taking a a method, especially if there's a promise in there that you won't then go to court or do something else. Go to court. Love the law. Uphold the law by saying it's really there and it hasn't gone away. Thank you.